often our studios are underutilized. So in a lot of the partners that I work with, we see the cycle studio, for example, is going unused 90% of the day. So when you add in virtual, you're now you're able to offer a variety of class options around the hours that the club is open with a zero added payroll. And it also serves as that backup in case an instructor doesn't show. You're listening to episode 186 of the Fitness Business Podcast. This month's premier podcast partner is Team Rockstar Fit, the mastermind team that helps fitness professionals and studios add nutrition, fitness, and online coaching to their existing business with tools from Beachbody. To find out more, visit teamrockstarfit.com. Welcome along to the Fitness Business Podcast. I'm your host, Chantal, and this week, my special guest is Amy Thompson. Amy is a national account executive for Les Mills USA. She's experienced in leading operations, sales, training, and programming for her own studio, several multi-club fitness chains, and franchise fitness brands. Amy is an amazing advocate for the fitness industry, and she volunteers in positions including Program Director Committee Chair for IDEA, Advisory Panel for ACE, and Chair of the Advisory Board for the National Personal Training Institute. One of the first ways I got to know Amy was through the incredible group that she founded called the Fitness Professionals Networking Group, where nearly 27,000 professionals share, collaborate, and support each other's businesses. In her current role with Les Mills, Amy consults with business owners and executives to increase membership, to engage and retain members, and to future-proof their clubs. She was the Idea Program Director of the Year Award finalist in 2016 and 2017, and the Idea Fitness Leader of the Year finalist in 2018. During this week's show, we talk about the relationship between group fitness and member retention, the effect that virtual fitness has on the member experience, we chat about why it's important to go back to basics with our class names and schedules, and we finish off chatting about how to use group exercise to optimize your club retention. It's almost time for this week's interview, but first I want to say a big thank you to this month's podcast partner. Do you own a club or a studio? Are you missing out on nutrition solutions and online coaching tools for your clients? Well, we have the answer. Just visit teamrockstarfit.com to find out more information and to schedule your free consultation. That's teamrockstarfit.com. Enjoy this week's interview with Amy Thompson. I want to say a very warm welcome to our special guest today, Amy. Welcome along. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. We, of course, are going to be talking about something that is close to, I think, both of our hearts, which is group fitness. And maybe you can kick things off by sharing some of the latest research with us on the relationship between group fitness and member retention. Yeah, well, retention is still our industry's biggest challenge. Um, We know that on average, our clubs are still losing 50% of their members each year. That said, we also know that group exercisers are much more likely to say stay at your club um, than gym only members. And the statistic around that is that they're 26% less likely to cancel. And so we know that in addition to group exercise, that could include other social assisted exercises like personal training, team training. And so we know that really as an industry, our goal is around increasing exercise adherence. So some of the things that I think are exciting that now the industry is turning to is how can, what are the factors that affect adherence and how can we as exercise professionals, instructors, personal trainers, how can we start to help our members around motivation, really helping them exercise because they want to and not because they have to, and then, and then helping them along the path to self-efficacy. And this is where we speak to helping them instill confidence confidence and competence so they feel more in control of their success. And then we know that social support plays a really, really big piece in their feeling a sense of belonging and really 
having that connection and relatedness. And so that helps with affecting adherence as well. Um, and some of the recent research around what we call groupness, if you will, it's a new, a new term we're kind of coining in the industry. It's finding that this, the group fitness classes encourage high level, levels of exercise exertion during class, and they provide a greater sense of overall satisfaction. So I would like to recommend Bryce Hastings. He's a leading physiotherapist as a future guest on your show to bring more around this research around groupness and self-efficacy because I'm excited that now we're helping fitness professionals with these types of factors that affect this exercise adherence. And that's actually a really interesting point, Amy, and it, it takes me perfectly into my next question because right then you were talking about that human-to-human connection. But of course, we have seen the emergence of virtual fitness coming into our clubs. And of course, Les Mills is, is a player in that area. We actually had Carrie Keppel on the show who talked about it uh, about eight months ago. I'm keen to understand if there's any actual data that you're aware of that, uh, that virtual fitness, around virtual fitness and the relationship that that has on the member experience and on member retention rates. We have. So we have data that we collect from our our partners globally. And you're right, it's growing uh, in the US. We've had virtual fitness in our own clubs in New Zealand for many years. So we have some data coming out of those clubs. Uh, But what we've seen is that the best clubs will always offer live classes with great instructors, but they'll also continue to offer virtual because it offers greater choice. And also, we know that our consumers expect to get what they want when they want it. And now they want it delivered in an experiential way. So the research is showing us that live attendance increases an average of 12% when clubs add virtual. And the part that I get excited about around this statistic is because this is suggesting that it's serving as a gateway to bring more people into live classes. Uh, Folks who might be new to exercise, they're intimidated by the environment. They can attend a virtual class where they can maybe be anonymous, um, do one track and leave. And then they can graduate themselves into a live class when they feel more comfortable. Uh, We also are seeing that virtual group fitness is reaching the younger market, uh, such as millennials and Gen Zs. Those folks are making up 30% of the virtual users in the studios. So that's exciting that we now clubs have another vehicle whereby to reach the millennial market. And, you know, I guess we talk about choice, but the flexibility of schedule is really key because most 70% of the users say that they're drawn to virtual because of the flexibility that it offers them to work out when they want to work out. I think that's a really interesting point that you just made in regards to virtual acting as a bit of a trial platform for people to get a feel for the class before they go into the main class. Because I was actually just having a conversation with a club manager yesterday where we were saying, you know, no longer do a lot of clubs have the financial resources to put on, you know, like new member training programs. You know, we were talking about cycle in in particular and I was saying, you know, we used to do these things how we would get the members in, we'd show them how to set up the bike, we'd do kind of like this is how how you get started with, with doing a cycle class but so many clubs these days just don't have that that budget that that allows for that so i would imagine that virtual as you explain it gives the club owner the opportunity to introduce new members to those classes get a bit of a feel for it and then as you say graduate to the live classes once they're ready to do so it does and i'm glad you brought up budget because what i didn't mention is that it doesn't add extra payroll so when an owner uh, often our studios are underutilized so in a lot of the partners that i work with we see the cycle studio for example is going unused 90 percent of the day so when you add in virtual you're now uh, you're able to offer a variety of class options around the hours that the club is open with a zero added payroll and it also serves as that backup in case an instructor doesn't show. So there's just a lot of benefits to club owners beyond the member facing benefit and what the convenience and, uh, and the, maybe it is this warm starter for them, but there's just so many benefits to the club owner as well. 
Amy, let's dive into the topic of actually some practicals on improving retentions, retention rates rather via group fitness. Is there any advice you can share with us or perhaps any examples of clubs or programs that you have seen implement a really outstanding retention campaign? Yes. So I am passionate about this topic throughout my career. I've uh, been primarily responsible for building onboarding programs. And so here I would say um, our top performers and top performers that I've worked with over the years, really they're offering an onboarding program that encourages a gradual increase in attendance, in frequency, and most importantly, in intensity. And thereby we're doing this not just into personal training, but also into group exercise programs programs. And so if a club owner is more prescriptive in nature with their group exercise program, and they simplify the schedule so that it's really speaking to these six main genres that most gym users would like to experience. Um, And if we can simplify the naming convention so that any person on your staff can easily direct a person to a class for the desired result or goal, then I think we will see a lot more members move to this this sense of um, self-efficacy because now they are getting their, they're getting their result and they're getting it in a way that is gradual and that is not making them sore and that now they're starting to meet those people like we talked about, the connectedness, the people that have similar goals. And they have a prescription of nature where they know I can go to this class on this day and if I follow this um, plan, it's going to help me get the desired result. And again, doing this not just through personal training, but by encompassing your group fitness offerings in that member onboarding program. Can you go into a little bit more detail around that? Because you mentioned in there six different kind of areas and and simplification of the name. Can you explain that in a little bit more detail? Sure. So uh, again, a lot of times our schedules are dictated by the the instructors we have access to and the times they can teach. And a lot of the schedules become very robust, meaning that they have a lot of unique names. Let's just Ah, use Amy's boot camp and um, core to the floor, whatever the name is, right? And so the challenge in that is that it might seem cutting edge and innovative, but it's very confusing to a new member to know what class that they should go to for a specific result. Mm -hmm. So the the genres are, um, it's your strength and weights, it's your cycle, it's your mind body, and really simplifying your schedule. So you have one to two offerings in each of those genres, and then that you have a very clear naming schedule behind that, that says this class will give you X result. And so that's what we help a lot of club partners to do is to scale back the different variety of names to make it simple for a new member to interpret and as well as the rest of their staff. And that will help them to see the result that they should get if they attend. Amy, I cannot tell you how much I love that statement that you just made because I have gone into so many clubs over the years where the name of the program is so obscure that you have no idea what it's about. And I'm an instructor and a personal trainer. So I love that you're just rolling that completely back to basics and saying, let's call it what it is. If it's a strength training, it's strength. If it's cycle, it's cycle. If it's mind body, you know, because there is nothing worse than a new member rocking up to your club and your front desk team not being able to articulate what the class is about because the name of the class is so complicated or the description is complicated. So I absolutely love that you have um, shared that with us and I want to encourage everyone to take this opportunity to have a look at their their timetable, their schedule, and just ask, ask yourself that question. Have I taken it too far that I've actually overcomplicated my program offerings to my members to a point that it becomes confusing or overwhelming? And are there steps that you can put in place to roll it back to these areas that Amy has just shared with us uh, to simplify it for our staff and for our members? So thank you so much for uh, for taking us through the detail of that, Amy. Um, You know, I think when I connected with you about this interview, one of the articles that had just come out in the media was the 
Equinox and SoulCycle opening up a full service talent agency for their fitness instructors, which I found was, was very, very interesting to read about. Can you talk to us about the role that group fitness instructors play in relation to retention? Yes. Well, as I said, uh, live programming with great instructors is actually the best place to start your focus in terms of strengthening your group schedule and your offerings. And so uh, a lot of the work should be focused around finding training, recruiting, and then teaching these instructors to be able to deliver high quality, sustainable exercise classes that really address the basic psychological needs of autonomy and relatedness and competence as we've been talking about. So uh, the best instructors are able to obviously coach to a class of all fitness levels, but we're also doing more and more coaching now around helping instructors to develop self-efficacy and to help the members with this sense of belonging and doing it in a way that's not dictating, but it's an invitation to participate at a higher level or a celebration that they've simply shown up that day. And so again, we've kind of gone full circle with the fitness instructor and, and how they coach to a class. But what we're learning now, again, in this behavior modification and this self-adherence and helping people adhere to exercise is really teaching your instructors and helping your instructors, training your instructors to be able to provide this motivationally supportive communication style. In regards to that that uh, fitness instructor piece, Amy, do you have any advice for us on how we can best nurture our instructors and not only to ensure that, that they have career growth, but also to ensure that we're keeping our business growth in mind at the same time. Yeah. So I think, you know, we want to first make sure that we have a strong team and a strong leader and that, that really everyone's goals are tied back to the, the company's goals or the club's goals. And that should be that we want to get more people moving and we want to build a stronger membership of people that are reaching their goals. So I think building a strong team around a unified goal is first and foremost, and then really helping your instructors feel valued. And oftentimes in the business model that most of us have in play, our instructors are very part-time, they come and go. So the more you can help them feel valued and part of the club's mission and part of the club's vision is is really, really important for them. It's not about the time they spend there, but it's about the lives they touch. And most instructors are not in this for the money. I know it's no secret. Mm -hmm. However, we as owners should honestly, we should be checking our compensation scale to make sure that it is adequate for the value that your instructors bring to you, but also to back that up with making sure they feel valued in your club. And then that they're supported in their growth and development. So you talked about opportunities for continuing education. There are more and more great resources and conferences and groups whereby group instructors can improve and hone in on these skills. And club owners could do a better job of helping these instructors find those resources and perhaps support them in these in attending these types of different conferences and training opportunities. And then just give them a chance to shine because if you've hired the right person, then truly your instructor has the ability to connect to the audience. They have the ability to celebrate, again, the, this effort that the, the member is making and really helping that member to feel this sense of belonging to the organization and to the group that they're in. And so your instructors provide that if you've hired the right person and really allow them to, to shine, if you will. I'm really grateful that you brought up the the professional development piece in relation to group fitness instructors, Amy, because I think what we can do as club owners sometimes is we kind of think, oh, they're a part-time group fitness instructor. They focus, you know, they might be studying or they might be working another job and they're just doing group fitness part-time. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't invest in their professional development. And as you say, support and encourage them to continue to develop, to continue to, to learn and attend conferences. And I think that you and I can both probably agree we've, we've just returned recently from Ideal World Convention, which was 
phenomenal. And I think any group fitness instructor that has the opportunity to be part of an event like that should jump at the opportunity. And any group fitness manager or club owner that can support their instructor in attending a conference or being part of some type of professional development, then it will only benefit your business in the long run. So thank you so much for bringing up that professional development piece. Now for this week's Fit Bispiration. Amy, there's one last question I'm hoping you can finish off with today. And maybe you can share with us your very top three takeaway tips that you would give club owners or club managers for utilizing group fitness to improve their retention rates. Sure. So number one, uh, revisit your group exercise schedule. It is the number one controllable factor when it comes to attracting new members. So think about, is it meeting the needs of your current members, but also is it attracting new members? Uh, Number two, recruit, hire, and retain rock stars. So we just touched on this, but truly they are your talent that will be the glue and help to connect those in the club. So that is absolutely an important place to focus when it comes to group exercise exercise. And then number three, this is where the virtual ties in and the millennials. We have to stay relevant. Our members' expectations are increasing quickly and uh, technology is evolving. And so that means that we need to stay relevant and we need to remember that experience is everything. So those are my top three. Amy, you are completely amazing. Thank you for being so generous with your information today and with your time. And I I love that we were able to tap into your experience in the industry. So thank you so much. We're going to be including all of your links so people can connect up with you online in social. They can reach out to you and chat a little bit further. So I want to thank you so, so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, Chantelle. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. A big thank you once again to Amy for joining us today. And a reminder, at the very start of the show, I mentioned her amazing fitness professionals networking group, which has 27,000 members. I've added a link to this week's show notes with a direct link to the group. So for those of you who would like to join, all you need to do is head to the show notes at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com and click on the link that's titled Fitness Professionals Networking Group. Are you interested in increasing your center's income and your trainer's income from small group training? Tribe Team Training is the new way to get more members engaged in small group training and paying extra. Click the Tribe Team Training link in the show notes or go to tribeteamtraining.com.au forward slash podcast for your free formula to see how much income you can make from small group training. Have you checked out the FBP Family Discount page on our website lately? The page is full of great discounts and offers on products and services from our wonderful podcast partners and suppliers from the industry all across the world. All you need to do to check it out is go to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash discounts and you can see all the great offers that are currently available. Once again, that address is fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash discounts. Pre-Core Quick Fire 5. This week's Pre-Core Quick Fire 5 guest is the CEO of Loud Rumor and the host of The Goat Show, Mike RC. Mike, welcome and thank you so much for coming back onto the show. I am super excited to be back on the show because you are probably the best host that I've had so far. You're the best interview I've had so far. You asked a really good question. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> So I can win over the audience that I know already likes you. And they go, okay, any friend of Chantel is a friend of mine. I seriously mean that you ask really, really great questions and you always have incredible energy. So I'm excited. Mike, what a way to start the interview. That's incredible. Uh, Well, I've got to say right back at you, my friend, because before we even get started on this interview today, I want to say congratulations on the amazing work that you have done with the GOAT show. You've got to tell everyone all about the GOAT show. Well, the GOAT show is this, okay, so you know I had the GSD show. And yeah. then, so basically what happened, I started, you know, little by little, I was introduced to really high-level players and people that were doing really, really big things, $100 million plus in revenue. And I was like, oh my God. And I just remember like, what I learned from them 
in an hour was just incredible. And I just kind of want to spend more time with them. So I was like, how do I find more of these high performers? So I created the GOAT show, GOAT, which stands for greatest of all time. And, you know, we kept a lot of the really same cool theme, that whole sports center look, but we added a few things, made it look extra polished. And everyone we sit down with, um, we've interviewed billionaires now, a few different billionaires. Uh, pretty much everyone's either doing a hundred million plus, or they're really trending in that direction quickly. And they're known as the greatest of all time at whatever it is that thing that they do or have done. So it's been really, really exciting. Well, I've got to tell you, every time I see a promo come up to the show, I am blown away by the guests that you've been getting. I mean, I've seen Lewis Howes on there. I've seen Jasmine Starr on there. Um, I think I saw Brendan Bouchard on there as well. I mean, just incredible. So, yeah, but we got Russell Brunson on, founder of ClickFunnels. Uh, this Jordan Zimmerman is awesome. He's got a four, uh, an ad agency, but it's $4.4 billion ad agency. He works with every McDonald's that you can think of. <laughs> he works with all Papa John's. He works with John Deere, like all these crazy things. But, but it's cool because marketing, at the end of the day, it's more of a philosophy than anything else. I don't care what industry you're in. When you learn how to look at what makes consumers behave a certain way, and, and guys like him really know that, you can take that and, and put it into whatever box you're in. In this case, we're fitness, right? So worked out really well. But yeah, some really cool people. You know who I? You know who comes out on Tuesday? Hey, tell, you. tell me. Okay, so when I was a kid, my childhood hero was John Starks, New York Knicks legend John Starks. I used to. I'm still number three at any sport I play because of him. <laughs> And I used to do everything he used to do, knew all his stat numbers, and uh, he was the heart of New York. And so I have him on as the GOAT of becoming the heart of a team. And um, he, he's just awesome. I actually play horse with him, which we called goats instead of horse. <laughs> and uh, so that episode comes out, and it's it's actually pretty oh. incredible. He talks about going up against Jordan and all the greats and, and uh, some cool behind-the-scenes stuff a lot of people don't know when they watch the game. Hey, that is incredible. Let me ask you this from, from one interviewer to another, who, and maybe he was yours, who's like that one person that you just really want to interview that you haven't spoken to yet? Who's on the top of your list? The one that I haven't interviewed, but I want to say, uh, Elon Musk. Oh, great answer. I would say I, I love everything he's doing. I love his missions. And, you know, I think he's got most that's a cool thing with marketing too. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the best CEOs out there really have a good grasp on the the wholeness of marketing, what it is, not the tactics and all that stuff, but you know, Jeff Bezos, when he talks about his customer first philosophy and how it always works. Right. And when you listen to Steve jobs, I mean, he was a visionary in the marketing, all the stuff that he did and more importantly, didn't do was around that Elon Musk and the stuff that he, right now he's doing this thing where you can be a part of building your own Tesla. You can actually come down to the factory and you can work on the Tesla in the factory that you're going to drive. It's, it's just so many cool things that he's doing. Isn't that incredible? So, you don't think of that. You don't see that. I mean, hard car has been being built for years. No one's ever been a part of that. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Excellent. Well, hey, I, I guess we better get on with the interview. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so we kick things off with our pre call quick fire five. So tell everyone, why do you do what you do? So I my first love was fitness, the fitness business, I would say. I, I was a personal trainer for seven years and uh I actually managed quite a few different clubs and studios and I just kind of was recruited from one place to another and, and then eventually started my own fitness business. And then I got into the marketing uh, industry. I really loved that because I always felt like that was the thing I loved most about the fitness business. And uh, yeah, I kind of went broad at first and I was helping everybody and anything. And then little by little, I found my way back to my roots. And uh, 2016, the beginning of the year, we decided to go back and exclusively do advertising and marketing just for fitness. We've been doing that since. And that's what we do. We help small fitness studios. And when I say small, I mean, you know, people that have like group classes. So we work with a lot of Orange Theories, a lot of Club Pilates, a lot of F45s. And uh, we work with 24 major franchises right now. And we basically just help them build up their fitness studios more than they've ever seen. Amazing. Amazing. And tell us, what's one ritual that helps you become better at what you do? Well, I have a morning routine. I'm a routine guy. And once I find a routine, I lock in. I'm actually pretty good at sticking to it. 
So I write my goals down every morning and every night. And, you know, I, I have my goals. I know them top of my head. The four goals right now are music room with lessons. I want a new office committed. So basically, I, I want a music room in my house so I, my kids can have lessons. I want to commit to the new office that we're going to move into. I want to go to Italy, which I checked that off my list a few weeks yeah. ago. <laughs> and um, I still write it down, though, because the feeling of checking it off, it's that feeling of like, okay, cool, I got one down, three to go. So I still yeah. write it, I check it, you know, and then um, getting my company to its revenue point, which I write that down every day as well. Excellent. I love that you've got, you've systemized that practice. It makes a huge difference. And I like that you pointed out the fact that even though you, and I saw your amazing photos when you, uh, when you, to Italy recently. I love that you still kind of have that there, but just cross it off the list. And I always talk about, I'm a whiteboard addict. I whiteboard everything. And for me, there's an immense satisfaction in in being able to kind of, you know, cross that, that task off the list there's something symbolic about it so thank you for uh for telling us that because i think that's actually important as far as recognizing the progress that you've made to achieve your you get better, um, your as, you you get better as you go because think about like when you have four things on your list you get one off your list like a little motivating two you're like halfway there and then when you have three you're like one left and it's this weird gap of feeling you have every day when it's just like that one that you can't check yes. and so as time goes on, you actually get better at getting to the goals because the motivation, the, the sense of urgency gets higher. Yeah, love that. Okay, now I know you're going to have a million answers for this. I'm going to ask you to bring it down just to your top favorite. What's one book, podcast, or blog that you would recommend and why? So I believe, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer that you want, but I also believe that reading is like music. So if you're going to go work out, you don't put on Frank Sinatra necessarily. And if you're going to have a romantic dinner, you don't play heavy metal. You play what's appropriate to what you need right now. And, you know, I think the important thing is figure out where your company's really having a hard time right now or where you think it needs to be stronger. And then that's usually the go-to type of book that I read at that moment. Because I know that every word I read is going to be so much more absorbed because it's addressing a pain point. And so I actually get more of the book than if I read it randomly. However, as a general sense, my favorite book is Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. And it really teaches you the concept of fear and faith. And even if you think you got a good grasp on avoiding fear and going towards faith, you'll probably realize when reading this book, you got a long way to go. Ah, love that. And I love your recommendation on, uh, on tailoring your reading or your learning to what you need the most in your business right now. And um, Mike, let's finish off today. Tell us a little bit about the topic that we're going to be focusing on during your main interview. So one of the things I think a lot of people don't focus on when it comes to marketing is the actual product and the pricing of that product and the presentation of that pricing because there's psychology that goes behind it. So a lot of people have a hard time understanding the difference between marketing and advertising. Marketing is the whole idea, like the marketability of this product and you know what, what, what are we going to sell and why is this the thing that we're going to sell and how does that make consumers feel? How do we get that feeling out there? And how do we price it and how do we play with the psychology of it all? Advertising is okay, cool. We got all that down. Now, how, how do we make noise and put it out there so people can see it? So, you know, with, with marketing though, a lot of people ignore that and you think that you, you ever hear people say in the sales process, well, if they tell you they need to think about it, it's probably because you didn't deliver enough value. Yeah. Well, it's, it may not be the case. You probably did deliver enough value. You just didn't present the pricing in the right way to where you can play on the psychology and get the person to want to buy this is such an important topic, Mike. So I'm really grateful for you uh, taking the time to come and talk to us about it. So look, I'm excited to dive into that during your main interview next week. But for now, thank you so much for joining us for the pre-call quick five five. Before we finish off today, a reminder that all the resources, the links and a transcript for today's show can be found at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. A big thank you to our foundation partner, Active Management. Active Management understands your business. You want more members or clients, so you need more leads. To get more leads, you don't need more marketing, you just need smarter marketing. To help you market smarter, you can get your free download at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash active. Thanks to our friends at Active Management for that great free download. Thank you to all of you for joining me for another week of the show. I look forward to seeing you next week. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Mm-hmm.